Um, I work for Camden, but I'm also the chair of the Camden Black Workers Group. And today we're going to have a discussion called Contemporary Activism in Britain. And particularly why we're still, why we're also celebrating the legacy of activists and journalist Claudia Jones, who was a major activist, uh, particularly in the Caribbean community in Britain from the 1950s and 60s. So as part of this discussion, we've got a round table panel and we've got Stella Dadzi, revolutionary black, from the Revolutionary Black Feminist Movement. And um, we've got Buseo Twins, policy specialist, take, take back the power activist. We've got Athian Akech, who I think I've seen Athian speak at one of the rallies that we organised with the councillors, um, I think it was earlier this year, who's the Camden's youth MP and a young activist. We've also got Gemma Samuels. Um, I'm going to ask them all to introduce themselves now as well. So would you like to start, Stella? If you can unmute yourself. Yeah, can you hear me, Hugo? Yeah, great. Hi, welcome. Hi, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, many people will know me as one of the co-authors of the Heart of the Race, Black Women's Lives in Britain. And um, I suppose in that context, I'm a writer, but I'm also someone who's spent most of my life in education. So I've been an education activist all my life. Um, and I am known as one of the co-founders of the organisation of women of African and Asian descent, which was a black women's organization that was set up in the late seventies to address the specific issues that black women faced in the context of the UK civil rights movement. Um, what else to say? I think um, um, many people will have accessed the um, archive that exists at the black cultural archive in Brixton, where a lot of my material is lodged. And um, some people may be aware of a book that I've recently published called A Kick in the Belly, which looks at black women and how they resisted um, enslavement in the British West Indies. Great, thanks. That's quite a, a comprehensive um, list of things that you've, you've got there, Stella. Well done. So the next person I'm going to introduce is uh, Busea. Hello. Busea? Yeah, thank you for, I just unmuted myself. Thank you, Hugo. Um, yeah, I'm a policy officer currently working for the Kensington and Chelsea Social Council, where I represent the community and volunteer sector. Um, as you know, Grenfell, Grenfell Tower tragedy happened in that borough. So part of my work is to engage with the community to make sure that any um, policy developments or community intervention has centers them and looks after the bereaved um, communities there. Um, I am also a social action youth worker for Take Back the Power. Many of you might know it. Um, it's a youth centered or uh, I guess project or movement in Camden where we encourage and support kids at, youth, at risk of youth violence to kind of um, find positive um, interventions and systems change to kind of affect the, world, affect the world around them basically and empower both themselves and their peers. So that's the kind of work I do and on the side of that I'm a social and political commentator um, using social media to kind of like break down current and complex um, affairs to I guess my immediate community, black and brown communities to ensure that they're able to engage in the topic but also show how it relates to them um, just so they can feel part of the conversation um, and yeah. Great. Well, thank you for that, um, Buseo. Next up is Athian. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks uh, for having us. So my name is Athian. I'm the youth MP for Camden. And kind of in that capacity, I do kind of a wide range of things. So I'm interested in how kind of the climate change 
the climate crisis affects our communities, things like austerity, the kind of socioeconomic roots of knife crime. So I think generally speaking, I kind of use speeches, activism, writing as a way of trying to represent young people in Camden, but also show how these issues um, kind of intersect. Because I think that what we're going to be talking about here today is all these issues are interconnected and tackling one is about tackling all. And so I've spoken in the House of the Commons, written for The Guardian, done loads of, I've been um, privileged enough to do quite a few of these things. And uh, yeah, I think that's a summary. So thanks for having us today. All right, great. Thanks again, Athin. And next, but by no means least, is Jamar. Hi, um, I hope you guys can hear me. Um, I'm Jamar. Um, I don't know, I'm really bad at describing what I do. Um, I guess I put into like three really cheesy titles of like activism, art and um, academia. Um, so academia, I just finished my undergraduate degree and I want to go on and do a master's and a PhD um, in sociology, hopefully. Um, in terms of activism, I've been a part of, I've been a part of this youth collective for about five years now called the Adelaide Academy which teaches um, young kids in South London about social justice and politics. Um, through that um, collective, I've worked part of a lot of campaigns, Legally Black, um, which had like a viral campaign where they recreated UK film and TV, um, famous TV film and like posters and we put around Brixton and we did an action around on Westminster Bridge about mental health last year. Um, I've also done the Tuazeshi Leadership Fellowship for Women of African Descent, which is tackle gender-based violence, and I focus on gender-based violence in the Caribbean. And in terms of art, I am a freelance writer, um, public speaker, and filmmaker. I worked on four documentaries to date. One of them won a BAFTA two years ago, and it was about me. So yeah. Great. Well, um, I'm sure we're we're all having to struggle with. Um, these panel discussions in this particular way, because it would have been obviously a lot better if we could have sat around the table and had our discussions that way. But we are where we are because of the COVID crisis. And I'm hoping that we will get as far as we can have quite a good discussion today about activism and how not just we've been drawn into activity, um, probably, I mean, I don't know if any of you know me at all, but I've been an activist as it were, for a very long period of time. Um, and so it's not just how we've got into activity, I suppose, but also how we're drawing other people into activity as well become, hopefully we'll have a, be, be able to draw that out for people at tonight's meeting. So I'm gonna start off by asking a few questions um, of each of you. And I'm, I think I'm gonna turn to Stella first, if you don't mind and ask Stella a couple of questions. And it's, um, I was gonna ask you Stella, you know, you, you once said that we're dealing with Black History Month and White History Year. And so this year in Camden, we've decided, particularly as a result of the Black Lives Matter movement that's taking place, it's really shot into perspective. But I think also the fact that it was seen that black people were more at risk of death and serious in illness because of this COVID crisis. Camden has decided to raise the bar in a sense and have a season and not just a month and our season is going to last until December. So I wanted to hear why you think it's important. I'll ask the other panellists as well why we celebrate it and if a month isn't enough then how do we move away from that? How do we try to make sure that I suppose something that we all want is that Black Lives is not just a historical footnote once a year, but actually is part of the narrative of being in this country and the development of this country and society in general. Do you want to start with that, Stella? Okay, thanks, Hugo. Um, yes, I did say I was tired of Black History Month, White History Year. I've said it on several occasions. And um, I think that's because I have a sense that Black History Month is past its sell-by. And I say that for two reasons. Um, partly for the reason that it tends to be the case that people focus all their attention on these issues on um, the month of October and tend to ignore them for the rest of the year, 
which I think in the context of schools and other organisations that, that respond to BHM um, is unfortunate. My feeling is that there is no real such thing as black history. Um, increasingly, um, it's about hidden histories. It's about people whose stories have not been included in the mainstream narrative. And I think by talking about black history, we tend to encourage people to think of black history as something completely separate to the general, general history that um, we learn in schools and um, through museums and other heritage organizations. Black people didn't come from another planet. And when we think about British history, there's absolutely no reason why um, anything should be taught in a way that excludes or airbrushes out um, black people and their involvement in that history. And I'll give you an example. Um, many of us would have learned about the Industrial Revolution as part of our history classes, but we may not have heard about where the cotton came from and the abuses and brutalities that were meted out on African people in order to create the cotton that um, incentivized people in this country to produce the machines and so on that led to what we, we call the Industrial Revolution. So I think that's one issue. Um, the other issue is just how watered down Black History Month has become. Certainly it started off as an attempt to focus on people of African descent who had historically been made invisible. And I think just because of British diversity, um, you've only got to look at the diversity in Camden to, to acknowledge that there are many other groups who are also people who have historically experienced colonialism, enslavement, migrant labour, um, imperialism, all those things that make us other. And to some extent, um, their stories are excluded. So I think we need to rethink Black History Month. And I'm very, very supportive of Camden's response by making it a season rather than a month. But ideally, I think it should be something that occurs throughout the year. Yeah, great. I mean, I was thinking that you know, this question of weaving it into the general history curriculum is something that's extremely important. I mean, you, talk, you mentioned there about the Industrial Revolution, for example, and many people won't know. Or they'll know that James Watt, for example, was the person that invented, in inverted commas, the steam engine. They won't know that his invention was financed because he was backed by slave traders. You know, so you're talking about the whole development of that, uh, of the Industrial Revolution, literally the whole development of it being based on the blacks, on the backs of that exploited labour that mm. took place. Yeah. Can I say yeah. one more thing? Ingo? Just one more thing before I, I, I give the floor to somebody else. I think the danger about history as well is that we focus only on history. And if we really were... Um, thinking seriously about how to decolonize the curriculum, I think we'd all have to acknowledge that there's scope for these issues to be introduced into every area of the curriculum, mm -hmm. into the maths that we learn, in the art, the literature, the science. There are so many ways in which black people's contribution, our creativity and um, our involvement is just ignored. And I think by just focusing on history, we forget that there are other areas of the curriculum where this needs to happen. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Basaya, what do you have to say about that? Um, I just wanted to say that, like, I this is what I love about Black History Month, in inverted commas, in a sense that Black people actually don't agree on what, what they think should happen. And I feel like, I take Stella's point. I'm, I'm, I'm very one of those people who are like, technically, we're not the only ones here now. And so what's going to happen is that you know how not rudely white people can be very lazy and they'll say let's make a let's make a Chinese history month they won't think about making it inclusive generally they'll just think about adding it on and that's not sustainable and it's not realistic because there's only so many subjects on the curriculum so it's better to make it inclusive than to make it necessarily a black history month but I feel like um not to sound like oh my gosh I'm I'm older but I do feel like that's a process that I think young black people have to go through to recognize that they are going to end up being tired of it I felt like when I was much younger in my teens, I was like, people who don't like Black History Month, they're just, they're trying to be different. Like, da, da, da. But then you get to your, you know what I mean? You get to your 20th one or your, or your 25th 
a black history month, we're like, yeah, eight months, nothing's really changed. So I feel like there's a process that we all have to go to to kind of get to that point. Um, but I wanted to add also, one of the reasons, one of the things that can be done or won't, but won't be done is to fact is that not only should it be implemented every sector or, or, or industry or field, but reconcile it with current modern day. And that's why it's difficult because there are still vestiges of colonialism happening right now. So for them to talk about as, as something in the past, they have to detach it from the present, which they can't do because the system is built upon and relies upon and, per, and still perpetuates those racial structures. So they can't really talk about how people were, you know, on plantations or sweatshop, um, plantations or sweat, um, plantations because the plantation has now turned into the sweatshop in Bangladesh. Or you can't talk about, you know, f um, how we used to enslave people when Congo is still, you know, fighting over resources that builds your apple. So it's still happening. It's just an evolution. So I think that issue, that and they're not even understanding their own history is one of the reasons why it will never really work anyway. Um, I think what they do need to do, apart from reconcile the, the, the present day and, and, and actually end slavery and, and you know, colonialism, um, is to, they would have to change their... I think they will, act to, they will actually have to believe in it and change their outlook. I don't think the aim of Black History Month, for especially for white people or for institutions, is to empower people. It is to do what they've been instructed to do, to avoid facing commercial problems. It's not because intrinsically part of their values is to embrace a diversity, because they've, at every turn and point, they've avoided empowering black and ethnic minority people, they've always found ways around it. And it's been how many years now? So clearly it's not something that comes from their heart. It's something that's been instructed upon them. So unless we get into the psychology and we really get into the hearts and minds of man, all this kind of stuff is like externally uh, um, pushed onto them. And when there's opportunity not to do it, they won't do it. So I don't think they've actually become quote unquote unracist or un, you know, discriminatory. I think they've been forced to go on a path that they don't believe in, but they know it's commercially um, um, favorable. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I don't think it works, but ultimately they would have to stop perpetuating the systems um, for them to now go into the classroom and say it was history. So it's not Black History Month, it's, 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 it's the kind of the modern day thing, but yeah, that's my take on it. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Athian, how, how have you seen this develop? Obviously you're starting out in many ways, aren't you, as a young activist. How, how, have you, how do you see this develop? Um... I think, kind of as been said before, uh, people use black history as a means of detaching themselves from the injustices of the present. And I think this happens this, and manifests itself in several ways in the UK. I think when we talk about racism and police brutality, we often talk about it like it's an American issue. And the kind of narratives we have, we very rarely examine the particular instances of racial injustice in the UK and the different movements which um, kind of arose. So people don't really know about people like the Mangrove um, Nine. People don't know about the kind of Black Power movement in the UK. Whereas we kind of very often Americanize and detach ourselves from the real racial injustices in our country. And I think it's part of a wider problem. That in this country, people are very uncomfortable about talking about race. It's kind of seen as a non-factor. It's a, it's a thing which happened in the past and we, we've kind of reached this supposed point of the end of racial history. And I think, whereas if we look at America, they have many, many things which are worse, but one of them is that they have a kind of frankness and a willingness to talk about the importance of race and racism in shaping their political systems, their economic systems, the injustice of the present. Whereas in Britain, when we look at kind of racial disparities on various different levels, people often detach that from historic instances and systems of injustice but but there's there's never that link that's made and i think black history month is not it's, it's almost a kind of cop out for a lot of people if we if we're serious about country um about tackling racism then we'd be very much focused on structural analyses of the present and not kind of the the way that we currently do Black History Month, but I, I think it's it's not necessarily a bad thing, but there is room for improvement, and I think we need to explore things which are beyond the kind of traditional things that we're talking about. So take the French Revolution. People very much don't know that actually the Haitian Revolution served to radicalize and influence that revolution because a lot of them were asked, "You believe in equality, you believe in justice, but you still have enslaved people," and I think 
we, we have to expand our imagination, expand what we want to do and, and kind of be critical about what aspects of, of history we're teaching. Okay. Um, Gemma, how do you feel that it can be changed or, because again, from an activism point of view, you know, people have said it's not quite what it should be or it's possibly past its sell by date. How do you feel that we should um, progress? Well, I'm going to do that question. Um, so, I guess, so in 2016, I wrote this really huge article um, called um, um, Is Black History Month Problematic? And the, the basis of my article was me kind of putting it on its head and saying, listen, I love Black History Month because it's in October. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah, you might need to just le turn your volume up a little bit. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's a bit better. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So basically, I was saying that um, I love Black History Month because it's October. I'm born in October. So it's a perfect season for me to talk about um, my blackness, myself, my experience, my community, whatever. And I spoke about how um, I grew up on Relton Road and it wasn't until I was in sixth form and purely by chance a Scottish friend of mine was like do you know who Olive Morris was and then I went on down this rabbit hole learning about you know the, the work of like Stella Desi and everyone else right and um I met um Vincent um Grace Johnson who still lives on the road and he's my neighbor and we say hi to each other and that kind of stuff it was, it was purely by chance after a conversation with a friend and I was like, why, why wasn't I taught this in school? I went to school down the road. I've been going to the Black Cultural Archives as a part of the Youth Forum. Um, why wasn't this like common knowledge to me as in my area where I grew up? Because I grew up in the community, in the space. Um, I love Black History Month, but I think I, at this point in time, I guess I agree with Bashar and Zella, where it's like, I'm getting to a point where it's like, why isn't it like, has, why hasn't it been integrated into the wider curriculum? But then, and then also, it's already been said, I feel bad for going last, but it's already been said we're like, we focus on America and their history and what's going on. And when we, and there's so many gaps and like, well, not gaps, but like every, every other day, especially this Black History Month, I think every other post on Twitter was like, do you know who Olive Morris is? And it's like, well, I know who Olive Morris is. A lot of people know who Olive Morris is. She was a Google Google, but yet there's still people who don't know who she is. And it's like, it's now becoming a, a thing for me, for me personally, where it's like, things that I now know, people are like, oh, do you know this? And obviously there's, I have those gaps in my information, but I'm starting to get really frustrated with the fact that we have to do every single Black History Month. Do you know about this Black history? Don't, uh, black, black British history, let's not focus on America. Let's focus on this area. Like I'm getting really frustrated that it's not, it hasn't been integrated into the wider curriculum and we're not learning Black History 365. Um, I don't know if it will be because like, there's so, that, that my, I went to Brunel University and my MP was Boris Johnson, um, and Hillingdon, they don't, I think they, don't, either they don't celebrate Black History Month, or they have a BAME History Month, and it's like, even that, why is, why is it BAME History Month? Um, so it's like, you can't, if people aren't even cel um, celebrating Black History, Black British History correctly, then there has, then I, I, I worry that we're not ready yet to then integrate it to the wider curriculum, but that's where it should be. That makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense, and I think that's probably the common theme from what everybody's been saying is why isn't it, it why isn't it, it integrated? But also to pick up on Athian's point, why isn't it made relevant to today? I was listening to a program on Radio Four the other day. I know probably a lot of you are going, "What channel's that? What channel's that? What's that on?" But anyway, Radio Four on the radio, <laughs> and there was. Um, one of the historians there was saying that actually when we view, when we talk about and view, you know, study history, we are always studying it through the prism of today as well. Um, and um, I thought that was quite an interesting point. And it, it sort of brings me to the next point because, or the, the next topic, which is, you know, people have got views about certainly Black Lives Matter whether it's, um, you know, whether, what the response has been to that organisation. And I was wondering again, do you feel like the Black Lives Matter is having an impact? Is it a movement or is it just something that's quite fleeting and it's going to be flavour of the month this year, but then next year we'll be back to the usual and we'll have forgotten about it again. 
again. I'll, I'll, I'll start this time, I'll start with Baseo. Um, it's difficult with Black Lives Matter, honestly, because I feel like it, not the organisation itself, but just the sentiment and the, and the rhetoric. I feel like it, it lives in the hearts of people. I feel like people genuinely believe that, that they're Black Lives Matter and they're like, this is something that they want. But the energy and the organisation to continue the movement in the way we've done it over the summer is a very difficult question. I think in this UK, we've been accustomed to being quite passive, potentially our generation, just because of the daily ba battles you face all the time, whether it's working long hours, trying to look for a job, or you're in school and you're facing all these micro questions, it becomes very difficult then to separate that and then, you know, push a very mature campaign in that defense of it. But I don't think it's for the time. I think it's, what I'm trying to say is that daily life doesn't make it convenient or easy for young people or anyone to push such a campaign on. And it's not for, the minority group to push that campaign in the way that we are doing it. It's not something that we can overthrow our ourselves. Of course, we can educate ourselves more. Of course, we can keep it on the agenda as much as we possibly can. But it's, it's penalizing people who are suffering to keep it going in the same way. White people have the luxury of en engaging it when they want to because it was COVID-19, everyone's at home. And I think that's why it became so big because people were actually at home. People like, couldn't go outside and distract themselves. It was like, yeah, that's the flavor of the day in terms of COVID-19. But I think it was a snowball effect one after another. Now we're currently, you know, um, raising awareness about all the atrocities happening in Africa. So I think it's a big thing. We don't know where it's going to go. We're in the middle of the second climate. So I don't, I can't say where it's going to go. But I think in terms of for black people, I think it's something we always believed in, but we just didn't necessarily believe that we could do something about it or we could speak up because they're so separated in, 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 in our approaches, in our communities. Um, we're so, we're so in, um, We've been incorporated so strategically into the wider system for which actually we just want to get ahead within a system rather than dismantle it as well so there's a lot of conversations happening whether should we dismantle the system or should i just try and get more more opportunities so i can get to the head of this of, the, of this capitalist system so it's very difficult for us to even we haven't even agreed on what we want the outcome to be you know a lot of people are saying actually let's do, abandon this country and go back to the caribbean or africa some people are like i'm black british and therefore i have a right to stay here and make things better for those who can't leave or those who don't want to leave so it's a big question and i feel like we are kind of having these conversations on the world stage and because the world doesn't give us an opportunity to kind of figure out and mature our campaign it's like we have to have the answers now so someone asks us what do we want we don't know everyone's like see the campaign's not good or if there's a few people in the campaign who are violent or whatever, the campaign's violent. And that's a more reflection on those who are looking at us rather than the campaign itself. So the question shouldn't really be on, is it, what, pe white people should be asked the question, is it for the moment? Not us. We could do this all day if we had the opportunity. But is it white people? Do you have the energy? Do you have the concern? Do you have the compassion to keep it on the agenda? Even when we stop, even when we have to do other things, even when we've got other things. It's one of many battles that we're facing. And if you look at the intersections as well, you've got... Um, black women's specific issues that we're facing that black men necessarily might not be able to engage with or support in the way that we might want them to. You've got LGBT community who are not supported by the heterosexual black community as well, who are also trying to get themselves into the core of the campaign. You've got different religions, you've got different entities. So the campaign is like, yeah, we believe our lives matter, but we don't even know what we're fighting for necessarily in, in a strategic sense. So um, the only, the only thing I would say is that it does need to have a, a better dialogue, intergenerational dialogue. The younger generation is quite far removed from the older generation. So we assume we're doing things for the first time. And we're not asking our elders, so what happened? What did you do? What advice do you have? Um, how can we engage you? But also how can we make sure that what we're asking for, we're also representing you? You know, a lot of our young people, their parents are working for the NHS. I always say the NHS owns black mums in the country because they own most of the black women you know what I mean? But what are we doing to make sure that even within the NHS, they have the responsibility to look after our parents or our, our grandparents as well, or whichever occupation they're in. We don't want to leave them behind. So there's a lot of things that I feel like we need to be said, but it's just difficult because when you're oppressed, you've got so many other things that you're doing. You know, you're, you're paying the bills, you're taking, you're looking for childcare, you're, you're fighting, there's, there's, there's gang and knife crime, you know, you're fighting teachers who are predicting you're low grade. It's difficult to come back and still feel like, yeah, I'm going to now um, fight for the system in a particular way. So I think the question should always be posed to white people. How, how much, how, how much of an appetite do they have to make sure that it's not just, um, for the, for the, for the moment, but for, but for a, a lifelong campaign or hopefully not a lifelong campaign, it gets sold. Okay. Athian. Yeah, I think, um, all those points are true that, that 
there are a lot of quite difficult questions we have to answer in terms of what do we actually want. But I think fundamentally, we have to realise the kind of differences between the American and British situation. And often the kind of tactics and rhetoric that's used here is kind of copy and pasted from America. And I think some suggestions is that we have to perhaps shift towards a campaign which is better at forming cross-community coalitions. Because I think, so black people represent approximately three to 4% of the British population. And there's only so much you can fight for as that 4% on your own. But there are things that universally affect working class communities across this country. They're trying to advocate for a higher minimum wage, trying to reverse the last decade of austerity, trying to put more money into the NHS and schools. I think those are issues which and points which could garner cross societal support because we've seen that. So I, there's some polling that's been done recently where about 80% of, of people who were surveyed did not want to go back to the kind of pre-pandemic um, economy. And I think in this moment, because of the coronavirus, because of the injustices that it's exposed, there is a desire to really fight for a better world that we don't return back to the same old injustices that we have. And actually, a lot of the issues that affect black people, it's not th this point I'm trying to make with nuance, because I think there are some, so some issues which specifically affect black people and, and different intersections within the black community. But still, I think an element of the Black Lives Matter movement has to be fighting for an economically radical future, one where we have a Green New Deal that delivers jobs, um, good jobs to communities who've been uh, kind of excluded from economic opportunity. We need to fight for a higher minimum wage. We need to reverse the last decade of austerity. I think there are no easy answers about this movement and it will, will require dialogue and effort. But I mean, structurally, it's quite difficult to campaign for most people. As Maceo said, people have work, people have other things to do. And it's about how do we create a culture of activism where like it doesn't consume people's entire beings and they actually have time to do other things because I think that if this is going to work it has to be a mass movement that that everyone can inclusively participate in. Mm. Yeah no I've, you've made some very very good points there actually and I'm wondering how do people formulate those ideas or those campaigns of where they want to do where are people doing that now? Gemma, what's your view on it? Okay, again, I was making notes because otherwise I would forget. Sorry, um, Gemma, you're going to need to move a bit closer to the microphone again, if you don't mind. Um, I was saying, can you say that again? Sorry. The Sorry, I, no, I was saying that, um, you know, the problems of developing and generating a movement, I think, mm -hmm. were highlighted certainly by um, Baseo, but Athens also put out some some ideas in a sense mm. of how the movement could move forward and i was just asking you know where where are those ideas being discussed where are people coming together to discuss those what what structures are they doing that in i mean okay so i was on a zoom call earlier um basically someone asked me this question i was like this is such a good question it's going to bug me all day and probably for like a couple of weeks and essentially the question was like, how is activism going to look now, you know, now that we're in a pandemic, social distancing and, you know, things are going to be like this for like, we're going to have a rough time for like maybe the next year or so at least, right? And so how, how are people organizing that kind of stuff? And I was like, well, I don't know. Because the way I was raised was like grassroots organizing, you get together in a space in the room and you talk and you discuss and share ideas and opinions and all that kind of stuff. And like now it's moved all online. I mean, in some ways, some, in some, there are some opportunities, you know, to gather in a space, but it's all online. So I think, I think, honestly, I think uh, there's an element of, like, we don't know. I don't have the answer. I don't know if anyone else has, like, a, a possible solution, but if, and I don't think that there's anything wrong with that in terms of, like, organising, because we're adjusting. But, like, in terms of, like, Black Lives Matter, not the actual organisation, but the, the movement and people that believe in it and are, fighting to ensure that black lives do actually matter they do um 
and that's across the globe. I think in terms of moving forward, it's like we have to adjust to doing it during a pandemic, doing it online, doing it while we're social distancing. Um, so in the most recent like resurgence of Black Lives Matter with George Floyd, I just, I just remember like people being online and obviously there was a lot of performative activism, but I remember people being online and like the three main things in terms of people, first of all, I was shocked that so many people that I know have no interest in like politics or social justice issues were sh showing that they are aware of what's going on. And obviously there's a level of it being performative and like superficial, but I found that three things that people were saying that came out of it, three simple things were like donate, educate yourself and sign the right petitions and that kind of stuff. I think it's like that where we have to think in terms of like in a digital sense of how we're organizing, how we're getting together, that kind of stuff. And like Bashari said it perfectly, where it's like the intergener intergenerational disconnect is there and that needs to be bridged because we are now doing activism, arguably more so in a digital space. And it's and in terms of like globally, like NSARS, that, that is something literally all my information has come from Twitter. So I think it's taking advantage, obviously it's going to be difficult because social there can be um, false information shared on social media, but taking advantage of the fact that we are living in a digital age and digital activism is probably going to be the main way we do things for the next, main, mainly the main way we do things for the next year or so, in my opinion. Okay, yeah. I, mean, I, I was going to say that, I mean, I, I've been around for quite a long time, been involved in a number of campaigns and I've seen some of them come come and go but normally there's been a, a residue left and but i was really um how, how would i put it i was really excited in the summer by the the number of people that came out certainly for the first you know few london-wide black white lives matter demonstrations that took place and you saw literally tens of thousands of people um you know actually it was black and white, but particularly people that you never normally see on demonstrations before. I mean, I'm a old hand at going on demonstration. Call it a demonstration, I'll be there. But you know, it, it's um, the way in which that seemed to be organized, um, or possibly it wasn't organized in, in the traditional sense, but the response um, was enormous um, at, at that stage in the early summer. And I'm just wondering again, you know, Stella, what do you think it was a, a, a movement, an organized movement? Um, or do you think that it was literally something that people just responded to spontaneously? Um, not that I believe in that. I'm just putting it out there. Do you think that it was just something people just felt they had to respond to, had to react to and said enough was enough? And they, they, they sort of came out, as it were. Well, I think your question was, was it a movement or a moment? And I think my answer would be that it was both. In the same way as civil rights, which I lived through in the 60s and 70s, was both. It was a moment in history that people responded to, some out of just the genuine outrage by at the presenting issue, others with a more deep-seated anger around um, the need to challenge racism and, and racist practices. But I think... Um, if we think about history, if we think about the way the civil rights movement impacted on my generation's lives, I'm in my late 60s now, um, it has had shock waves that have continued to be felt throughout my life. And um, I think to some extent, I see the Black Lives Matter movement as a continuation of that initiative um, rather than something new. Um, Certainly, I am alarmed that we're not so focused on the idea that black lives outside of the West matter. I'm glad, um, I think it was Bulu, uh, Busayo who said that there's been more of a focus now on some of the injustices in our countries of origin because black lives matter across the globe. and. I think there's a tendency to do a little bit of navel gazing sometimes and just look at the issues that directly concern us or affect us. Um, I also think that it's led to a lot of gesture politics. Um, I don't really care whether we sing Land of Hope and Glory and change the lyrics. I think that 
the changes that we would wish to see are structural and institutional and um, a little bit of tinkering around the edges actually doesn't make any impact on most people's lives. I also liked Athens' point about how to keep it real, we need to have not just a race focus, but also a class focus, because the danger is that movements um, could divide people as well as bring them together. And although the initial response to George Floyd's murder was people of all colours in all parts of the globe coming out onto the streets and saying this should not be happening. Um, I think there's also a long history in our struggle of divide and rule. And that means we have to find strategies that will bring others along with us. I think racism is a problem for all of us. And um, I'm mindful of some of the um, lessons that need to be learnt from history so that young people who are involved in the Black Lives Matter movement don't try to reinvent the wheel or um, forget that there's actually shoulders that they need to stand on. Um, I'm thinking, for example, of OAD, which was an umbrella organisation that acknowledged that people would have their own issues in their own local communities that they would want to focus their energies on. And that as women, clearly, there were only so many hours in the day. But by creating this kind of umbrella organisation that allowed the issues to feed up through and be disseminated through the voice of OAD, we, allowed, we, we, we created a very broad coalition that enabled people to focus on the issues that mattered to them and their communities, but nevertheless do it under the broad umbrella of an organisation that had some general um, um, social goals. I do think that for BLM to actually have um, the impact that it should, there needs to be a clearer agenda around what its objectives are. And even if those objectives are limited to an end to police brutality or an end to unnecessary incarceration, those kinds of issues should be explicit so that people actually know what they're buying into. Because Black Lives Matter as a slogan is too generalist really to create that kind of political focus that will lead to effective social change. Yeah, no, again, I'd agree with quite a number of the points that you've made there, Stella. I think that it's, you know, Black Lives Matter is seen as a slogan. Um, and in terms of organisation, organisational development or even organisational organizational capacity, I don't think anyone's clear where that is. And I know Black Lives Matter doesn't say that it's a, sort of a centralised organisation as we would know it um, from activism in the past, particularly if you go back to the civil rights movement where things were really, really tightly organised um, in order to make some very significant changes that took place there. There needed to be very tight organisation around not just the active activities that took place but as you say what are the objectives what are the demands of the movements what are the things that need to happen to make change and so i think that's a you no know, it's a very very important point um and i suppose that brings on to the the next question that i've i'm coming to really is this question about allyship anti-racism um, or people not being racist people being active in terms of making sure they say that things shouldn't happen and not be bystanders you know and and how does that integrate in, interact really with how does the activism or activism of the movement interact and what role do we think white people have to play in it and i was again one of the things that i was really impressed with over the summer was particularly the number of young white people who really live in a very different society than from the one that I grew up in this country in the 60s, live in a very different, particularly if they live in the, in the inner cities, what role they have to play. Let's start with you, Ethine, this time, as well as you're the um, Camden's young MP. You uh, say, rather, as I think it'd be quite, quite useful to hear from you how you think you know, particularly your generation is pulling together on this issue. 
Yeah, I, I, I think that was one of the most noticeable things about this summer. But we, I think kind of in this entire conversation, we have to be careful to not individualise a lot of these problems. Because often when we talk about kind of, I'm not saying self-education is important for white people and all these different things. But actually, we have to think about the two main kind of sources of power in society. So you have capital, you have the kind of businesses, people who control money, and you have the, those who operate the state. And actually, in our kind of current framework and setup, most people don't influence greatly the kind of movement of capital or the actions of the state. And if we're very serious about kind of tackling these issues around police brutality, around all the other various claims attached to and demands attached to the Black Lives Matter movement, we have to be careful to not um, kind of individualize these problems, even if in the best possible world, everyone was entirely educated about these issues. The, the kind of forces of power in our society often stop progress from happening. So like an issue which is totally, not totally detached, but an issue which is separated from this is kind of climate change. People talk about climate change and say, oh, everyone needs to do their bit to stop climate crisis, et cetera, et cetera. When actually it's a bunch of massive corporations who are contributing very massively to this issue. It's the same with racism. It's not some people in some, it, uh, like it's not some white people in a working class community in the coastal area who are controlling the way that our prison system works. It's not them who are, um, who have produced an education system which discriminates against black students. So I think it's a balance of self-education. And I think my generation, young white people are kind of a more educated generation on these issues, but still we have to be careful and, and do a proper power analysis of who really runs this country, who has the levers of power and how can we ensure that they do things which will kind of lower structural racism. This isn't about we don't live in a society where power is diffused equally. We're not, often most of us are not actually actors in the way that things work. And our analysis of how we should act, it should, should bear that in mind. Okay. Gemma, what do you have to say on this? I mean, I guess I sort of agree. I think, um, and he touched on it, it was like, in, <laughs> I think a lot of, um, to, for the lack of a better word, just like the younger generations are extremely woke, but at the same time, I feel like there's a lot of miseducation happening as well. To use the example that he used, um, like in terms of like you know everyone trying to reduce their carbon footprint because you know climate change, when it's really the companies, um, wow. And so like instead, like imagine if it wasn't like, cause, and that's happening because people are being educated to think that you know their personal carbon footprint footprint is like messing up the planet but what happens if you know we educate everyone to say how about you turn your attention to those corporate companies is a simple switch as that so i think um i don't know i think there's a lot of education happening on a, a lot of people are aware of a lot of things but like there's still gaps and there's still work to be done um and there's still a lot of conversations i personally feel like like i said before like intergenerationally it's like there's so much so much that's already happened that's been done it's been tried and it's like nothing is new nothing is you know it's the work is there in terms of like writing and the organizing and the activism like it's all there it's just literally to educate yourself on that um and i think that intergenerational disconnect is something that needs to seriously be addressed um so can you repeat the question again sorry yeah no it's really about what's the role how do you feel that white people in particular can be active in this um in this movement so i think so again this summer i think it was selena, selena gomez i don't know if anyone's familiar but she's african american singer and actress whatever i think she and then someone else did it, i think what's it zendaya like basically two like former disney stars they gave their platforms up to the co-founders of um black lives matter in the u.s to like take over and do their thing this um sharing information and that kind of stuff and in terms of the organizing the work that they do and that kind of stuff but i think and what's the word is it platforming i guess platforming like that is really important necessarily in especially when it's like a white person in a position of power obviously the way it's done is very specific like don't do it in like a patronizing tokenistic way of, oh my gosh look at me i'm a white savior helping this poor black person kind of thing get, get to this platform that they never had before um i think that is one way in which it could be done. I think also 
again educating yourself and it sounds really simplistic but like literally there's so much and there's so much edge like information that's going over people's heads i'm just like really this is this is common knowledge for like the communities and the spaces i belong to but some people really just don't get the basics of like organizing and campaigning and to bring about change like it's a lifelong thing it's not gonna be fixed in a day it's not gonna be fixed um in our lifetimes to be honest um but we made the commitment to do to do the work um i guess what else is there i think that's it for me yeah that's, okay. that's cool i mean I, I was gonna say stella that one of the things that i know i mean i'm i'm a also, as being chair of Camden Black Workers Group, I'm also on the national executive of Unison, which is um, you know, the, a big public sector trade union. I know that there's been loads of struggles that have taken place so that anti-racist struggles are properly reflected in the trade unions and that they play a role. And that was one of the things that I know I've been critical of trade unions in general for not being involved in the very start of this movement. I mean, again, you, you raise the question of class, which I think is very important in this struggle. But do you think that, that those organisations that are there, particularly trade unions, have got a role to play in terms of the education and having and collectivising that idea of the struggle that, that we, have to, we have to continue to wage on this issue? I think that's a bit of a rhetorical question, to be honest with you, Hugo. Of course, trade unions have a part to play. Traditionally, they have um, been wanting sometimes, if you look at struggles like the Grunick struggle, Asian women, um, you know, they were sold out by the trade union movement. So um, some of them have to educate themselves first before they actually go ahead with the challenge of educating their workforce. And of course, the trade union movement has been seriously, um, well, it's seriously lost its teeth, hasn't it, since the Thatcher years. Um, what we saw as a trade union movement then is, is pretty much a shadow of itself today. But I'd like to go back to your original question. I really liked what Ethan was saying about looking at where the power actually lies. And I was reminded when he was speaking of a little slogan that, or a little um, equation that we used to use back in the day that racism equals prejudice plus power and I think that's quite a useful um, um, slogan to think about because um, if we think about racism of course um, the history of racism tells us that it was developed as a direct result of the enslavement of Africans as a justification for the exploitation of their labor. And I don't actually think much has changed to this day, although labor looks very differently now as it, to, to what it did then. So clearly um, the most effective intervention that anybody could have is to begin to look at those power struggles, look at how racism supports those power, those power systems and try to challenge that from wherever um, they're, they're situated. But I also think the issue of prejudice, prejudgment, um, which we could extend to actual ignorance, is something that everybody, all of us, white and black, I think we've already discussed how young black people don't know their own history because of the failings of the school system. So really it's incumbent on all of us to keep ourselves aware and mindful and updated with the issues that that impact on how racism is experienced in society. Um, but ultimately, the way it's going to be dis dismantled will be by focusing on those organizations and structures that sustain the power system that we live in. And um, that's a bigger issue than just one or two white friends or one or two demonstrations. I think, as somebody said, it's a lifelong dedication and it's something that you do from whatever position you're in. So if you're a white teacher, for example, there's lots that you can do, both to educate your young people who you're teaching, but also to challenge some of the structures in the school. Um, I do think, um, I, I did want to say that, you know, for a lot of people, um, there's a sense that racism will go away when we see a few more black faces in positions of power. And I think that's a dangerous delusion that, you know, we have our Michelle Obamas and, and our 
Oprah Winfrey's and our um, Diane Abbott's, but that doesn't actually substantially change the lived experience of most black people. So the point that um, somebody made earlier about, you know, really beginning to think about what actually um, inequality, sorry, equality looks like is an important um, dimension of the discussion we're having. What does equality look like? Is it just about opening up the boardrooms and the House of Commons so that more of us can get in? Or is it about actual structural and economic change that will transform the lives of those people who tend to be right at the bottom? And I include in that analysis um, the migrants and the people whose bodies are littering our oceans as a result of that migratory journey north. Mm. Um, Paseo, how do you feel about this, this particular question? About the role of our white counterparts in the movement? Yeah. Actually, um, well, I think contrary to popular opinion, just generally, they are essential because it is, as a, as a majority, at least where we are, they have the levers to change things. Even though we don't like to believe that, they're the ones that we're convincing of our own, of our own worth, right? Where it's not us that, well, a lot of us need to be convinced that we are worth something, but it's also saying, by the way, don't treat me this way, and they're majority. But also, um, their proximity to, again, the, the prejudice plus power, those organisations, it's going to be them. When people are talking about climate change, people are saying, why are you blocking the roads where you can have a dinner conversation with your father or your mother? Why are you pretending to do this whole fake solidarity on the roadside when it's your dad who's got these companies or your grandparents got these companies? So I feel like the honest truth is that they play an essential role. The issue is we have to think very honestly about what incentive they have to engage in a conversation for which they will be shown that their position in society wasn't based on their hard work or based on some innate superiority, but based on circumstance and plundering and, and rape of other people and whatever's happened. These are the big questions we're having. So regardless of if they want to engage or not, we're, we're applying that grace to anyone to say, you know what, yeah, you're gonna, I'm basically gonna tell you that you, you got here for this reason. It's not the easy conversation to have. They will give you the convenient wins. So when we move up in you know politics and all those kind of things, those those um, visible ones, because they're not real power. It's just symbolic, and they, and, and we and we we always take symbolic gestures as as change, and that's why we fight for dumb things like a lot of other community. You never see. I think the black community is really the only community that sp uh, spends so much time on how much representation we have in parliament. Other communities don't make such a big noise about that. Not to say that they're better off or less off than us, but our our focus on that. It's good because obviously there's power in symbolism, but in terms of to what degree do we actually need that to, to, to kind of solve the issues that are at hand. So sometimes I feel like we, we, we take the symbolic ones. Um, and I think, although we're all affected by racism, it is quite an intellectual field. I mean, the issue is with these companies and all these big organizations, they always make it look like, say, when you study sociology, or when you study history, you're not studying a real topic because it's all about STEM subjects and that's where the real intellect goes. But really and truly, to understand race, race relations, it's difficult. You need to apply yourself. It, 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 it's, an inter, it's an interdisciplinary field and people spend a lot of time developing knowledge. So if you think you're just going to post a, a page on someone's understand how, how, how racism intersects our daily lives, you're having a laugh because it's so intrinsic. People are, that's why when Stella said, you know, some people don't know their history or, or how racism affects you because sometimes we're making it like to say racism is that you've called us the N-word or you've actively tried to distance yourself from me. Those are the easy racisms. Those are racism are the ones where it's like, oh, so it's quite performative. The harder ones is the fact that they don't even know they're being racist, a lot of them. That's the worst one because it's an invisible. So they're essential to it because, again, their numbers here, but their proximity to power, but also we're, we're addressing an ignorance. Ignorance is difficult. If you know someone is purposely being evil to you, like, you know, you can talk about, I don't know, the prime ministers, they're, they're the minority of people who know better. They just don't want to do better because they're benefit, they benefit from it. So they know what's happening. They're just like, yeah, cool. That's why they tried to peddle Brexit against the white working class who don't know better because they haven't, they're not integrated into the system enough to actually be like, well, let me have this critical analysis when they're also trying to struggle to keep their identity together in whichever part of the world that, or if, part of the UK they are. And that's me just trying to be generous and say, I get it. I get why you're even racist, or I even get why you're isolated because you have not found the benefits of the system that you feel like we're benefiting from. 
But the rest of the people, it's an ignorance. How do you address that ignorance? And it's not through what we're doing by saying, you've done this, you've done that. It's a difficult thing. And until these organizations um, elevate racism as an as a intellectual field, it's going to be difficult to convince them because they're always as an ad hoc thing, like, yeah, ad hoc, ad hoc, ad hoc. They, like when, they, when, they, when you come in to talk about racism in organizations, they almost want you to do it for free or for a hundred pounds. Cause it's not that deep, it's not that big. It's, it's like a diversity thing. But if they were to get someone into a, a consultant, or for their strategy, they'll pay them millions of pounds or thousands of pounds because they think it's essential. But racism is exactly the same thing. There's an expertise inside that a lot of them don't have, but it's, a, but it's essential to development of their organization or whichever um, KPIs that they have. So yeah, it's, they're very essential, but I feel like we've kind of downplayed the kind of hill we're climbing and therefore we're not equipped as well to really engage them in the way that we should really engage them. Okay. Right, okay. <laughs> Um, I'm going to move on a, a, a bit now. So Stella, um, you've often been called one of the founding mothers of black British radical feminism. What, what's your biggest challenge in getting your voice heard at a time when women are just getting equal rights and, and how's this made you even harder as a, as a black woman? Hello? Stella? Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Can you hear me? <laughs> I can, yeah, yeah, yeah. You go, I'm going to be relatively short because I'm really mindful that we've got several more questions to get through and you also want to bring in the audience and we're meant to be finishing in 20 minutes. So I'll try and be quite brief. Um, you asked me what some of the challenges were. I think um, in terms of, of black women organising, clearly the, the primary challenge was um, convincing both black men and other black women that there was a case for us coming together and organizing as as women um, at the time we were accused of splitting the struggle or um, diluting the focus of, of black liberation and civil rights and um, for black women of course the the response to that was but we're 51 percent of the population so um, that was an issue. I think there was also an issue around reconciling the kind of feminism that we were developing or the feminist activism we were developing with what we were seeing in the broader white women's movement, which quite often um, focused only on issues of gender rather than more intersectional issues of, of, of race, gender and class, and which often failed to um, include in their campaigns and analysis what it meant to be black and female. So that was another challenge. And I think the third challenge was just in terms of determining who was part of the club. We organized around a principle of African and Asian unity because we recognized at the time that although racism was experienced perhaps differently in different communities, the source of it was the same. And since we were um, talking earlier about the legacy of Claudia James, I think it's worth reminding people that one of the newspapers that she produced was an African and Asian Gazette or, 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 or newspaper. So um, that whole issue of who is part of this struggle, um, who's included, what are the primary issues that we want to address and, and, and challenge, all of those were challenges for us then as they remain challenges now. Um, how it was made harder as a black woman, I think that question is pretty um, um, easy for most women to answer. You know, if you've got children, relationships, careers, study, all the other things that um, impact on our lives and community issues as well to address, then there's only so many hours in the day. And I think um, that can be disheartening when there's so many issues that need to be addressed. But um, Certainly, we overcame most of those challenges. We, we had an impact and even though the organisation itself didn't survive um, beyond about five years, the impact is still felt today. So um, I think that's, that's a positive message to remind people of. Yeah, great. I, I think, um, I know we've got other questions to ask and we'll try and do that, but I think I'm going to try and bring some questions in now and I'm going to ask Janelle if she'll ask the questions and Perhaps if we can have some fairly snappy responses to get round them as quickly as can. I don't want to stop people from 
obviously given as full a response as they as they can do on it. But Janelle, do you want to come in and ask some of the questions that people have been asking in the chat bar? Hi, Hugo. Thank you. Um, we've actually had some quite good reflections in the chat bar today. Um, so I'll give some of them and then refer some of the questions on to you. So Becca agreed about white people stepping up and having an appetite and commitment to making this a constant agenda and not just for a month or for a moment. And she was part of a conversation about making a Black Lives Matter workshop mandatory. And a black manager in her service actually said, racism is mandatory for her every day and she doesn't get to opt out. And for Becca that really stuck um, because she's right, white privilege enables opting out. Um, and then we had Carol reflecting on how radical activism has changed over time and whether handing over black history to the establishment is its downfall or is the expectation that it evolves. Um, so if it's effective, is it about the focus and not necessarily the destination or vice versa? So I don't know if you wanted to refer that on to anyone. Yeah, I mean, I was just, just going to say, I mean, how, how would you take that up, in? Start with you. Uh, sorry, what was the question? Sorry. <laughs> so it's just people reflecting on, um, you know, the way in which racism sort of develops. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's um, obviously really crucial. And just kind of a point on that is that um, if we want to persuade people and if we want to influence society, then I think as a movement, we need to um, kind of learn how to command convincing language. So one issue is just um, defunding the police. When people hear that, it's, it's, I totally agree with the kind of sentiment of addressing the root causes of crime, but it's bad political communication people instantly think that like you're trying to turn society into something that's just full of crime, where actually you want to secure people's safety by making sure they have a house, stable employment, access to healthcare. So on all these issues, we as a movement have to be very good at kind of communicating to people effectively using powerful slogans that generally communicate what we mean and that they can't be misinterpreted. I'm not sure if that's a very good reflection, but that's just- Yeah, yeah. Janelle, bring another couple of questions in. Because I'll try, okay. try and see if we can get the panel to <laughs> pick up on cool. some of these. Cause... That's fine. Um, so we had Stephen say, Black Lives Matter seems to be pretty massive um, and is being recognised worldwide. However, the media doesn't seem to be representing it fully. Um, and we've seen how social media has been used as a resource for many to gain information on what's going on in the world. So he's asking, is social media a better forum than actually expecting corporate papers to represent what's going on? Or is that problematic in itself? Okay, so I'm going to ask um, Basaya to, to come in on this one. I'm not even sure I understand the last bit, but is social media a better forum than expecting corporate papers? I mean, everything, uh, even as you said, you know, in the process of making change, there are many different wins along the way. Some wins are just about raising awareness and that in itself is what you need to do. Some wins are about convincing people. Some people, some things are actually about having to change a particular policy. So I think social media has done a good job in being able to disseminate information a lot. I think Gemma said that before, there's a lot of information out there. The issue with social media is that it's not, it's not, it's no longer an information deficit. It's the inability to analyze and, crit and, and have a critical analysis of the, it, the information presented to you. So it gets overwhelming and people don't know which bits are true. You've got a lot of fake news coming about. You've got a lot of very biased um, and strongly um, emotive uh, writing. So it's difficult to even know what is true, what is false, what should I align myself with? And then obviously you've got your being bullied into being left or right wing in certain situations. And sometimes it's just not even about that. It's just about what is true, what is right, what is wrong. Um, and then sometimes, but then sometimes corporate papers are necessary. I mean, if you've got a particular means to an end, you know, if there's something to do with money there, if they're the ones involved in something, you need their attention. So I think it's about dissecting the issue at hand and saying, you know what, for this particular issue, all we need is to raise awareness. But for this issue, we actually need this. And who are the stakeholders at each key point? And what do we have to do? I think many people always try and choose between, do we have to write a policy or do we need to mobilize or do we need to protest? It's like, you can do all of them. I don't, I don't understand a movement that only has to do one. I, I think it's one of those ones where it's, it's people just trying to perfect a movement that isn't perfect. And that's the whole idea. Do something, do something that makes sense. But if you have the expectations of it being perfect, you're going to just do nothing. And that's what people are waiting for. People are waiting for a perfect execution. And if it's not perfect, they just don't bother and they wait for someone else to do it. So I think it's yeah. just a combination. 
Gemma, how, how do you feel about that? About the use of different media in particular and the role of different media in that and how, and who's controlling it? How do we, how do we get control of it? How do we get the right messages out there? Sorry, can you just move a bit closer to the mic again? Sorry, um, I was saying that it's a bit complex because like, I think ideally to summarize it, it's just like a balance of both like traditional newspapers and social media because for Shine it's really interesting. So I don't know if anyone, if anyone knows, but like right now there's like a ship with some like an old time that's like been left out in like the Caribbean Sea that's like belongs to the Venezuelan government, that kind of stuff in US sanctions have affected it and all that kind of stuff. And this has been left out there since like, I think like last year and it needs to be fixed. And my friend is trying to get a hashtag called fish, fix the ship going on social media and he's been trying to get the BBC to fix out. And it's, it's really funny because like in terms of like the Caribbean Twitter, especially young Caribbean Twitter that I'm a part of, it's very much like we're all retweeting it, we're all sharing it, the information is getting out there. But at this moment in time, Twitter's quote unquote has arguably done its thing. He's trying to get the BBC or CNN to pick it up. So it's like, I guess a balance of both, because it depends. I think Boshaya made a really good point about policy and protesting. And like there's, in terms of activism, there's different ways to get things done. And there's, 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 there's different avenues. And basically you need to like exercise all of them, not just one. And ultimately a balance of both social media and traditional newspapers um, are gonna be out there because obviously traditional newspapers, they're biased. They have whoever's running it do, with their own agenda. And then also social media, any old person can make a thread on Twitter and people are going to be retweeting it and it could be absolute trash and lies and nonsense. So a balance of both, I think, is ideal because honestly, without social media, there's so many social justice issues. Like what's happening in Nigeria, I know so many people that wouldn't know what's happening otherwise without, the, without Twitter. So I think a balance of both and but also, Bashai said it again, I love Bashai, she always makes a good point, um, critical analysis of what you're reading and taking in at all times. Yeah. yeah. Um, Stella, I mean, how do you feel about that? Because I, I, I've i um, seen, especially with the, uh, the, the, the newspapers, obviously they're owned by often multi-millionaires and they print their own th things. They think they print, often print the views of those multi-millionaires and nothing else. How do you feel about both the print media and the use of social media for activism and, and, and how can... How can the movement, how can a movement, an anti-racist movement, not just take um, take advantage of that where it can, but is there a case for it to have its own media? It's a difficult question. I think um, um, other speakers have already alluded to the fact that there's a lot of information on social media, some of which is quite dubious and um, sometimes it's fake news or whatever other term we want to use so it's quite difficult to know um, you know the validity of what is coming into your phone but having said that I think social media has been hugely important as offering a corrective to some of the more um, traditional narrative that you hear expanded in traditional newspapers and, uh, and television and, and, and uh, uh, national media so I think it's, it's a balance between both um, I know, and I think everybody will be aware that, you know, organisations like the BBC have um, almost just discovered racism in the last month or, or so. It's, it's amazing how much interesting information is out there, how many useful documentaries, how many um, interesting people are now coming to the fore as a result of this, this response to Black Lives Matter, and, and that's equally valid. So I think both of them have a role to play and we have to continue to try and get um, those organisations to continue to focus on these issues and not to see them as a kind of sideline or as, uh, as something that they can squeeze into a month. Okay, cool, cool. Janelle, have you got another question for us? It may have to be the last one. Yeah, I agree. This should be the last one and then we move to closing statements. So we had one from Jenny who agrees about forging alliances. And a question for the panel is, several Camden schools have over 80 to 90% from other non-white ethnic backgrounds um, in a class. And her son, for example, did not have any white friends at school. How can we get our schools to reflect the diverse community in Camden so our children can have 
a diverse range of friends. And Menaxi also said something similar around, is there strength in finding the commonalities between people and fighting for those? Mm, okay, great. So those, those are, are good questions. And of course, I'm going to preface this question a little bit about what schools can do so that you also need to, you'll also need to, in your answers, tackle what restrictions there are being put on schools by the government, especially in terms of, in terms of the curriculum. Um, Paseo. Yep, we need to answer. Um, I don't know, the question for me is a bit weird in the sense that I don't know if the question is saying you want your son to have more white friends or you're saying that you want your child to benefit of diversity, because if there's no white people in your son's school, but there's other people from different countries, then I'm sure he's benefiting of diversity, and there's other places you can find white people in the UK. But obviously it's a preference for your child. I don't really know what, what the argument is, but for me, I think sometimes it's about, I don't know, it's, it's a difficult, comp I, don't know, I, don't know, I don't know what you mean. I don't know, I wouldn't, I understand from a certain point of view, unless you have a premium on what white kids can offer your child, and maybe if there's more white people there, there's something that you would learn from them. But if it's just about diversity, then I feel like as long as the rest of the kids are from different backgrounds, your child will learn. I think the issue is, is that there is a correlation between schools that have a majority non-white population and how they excel in school for some reason. And that is to do with kind of the racist structures that are there. Obviously, there's a lot of social economic factors that normally, um, I guess, uh, follow those young people into the classroom which make it difficult for them to engage in a way they should but there's also probably poor teaching poor funding in the schools poor um, equipment um, and they don't have the opportunities like other schools do so I think it's less about I think if your question is about it's their life their prospects I think it's less about the kids in the school but the way the school is set up to engage and, and support those students um, um, so yeah that's that's my that's my point of view if I understand your question properly because otherwise I don't think it's I don't think it's necessarily your child has more white kids I think it's I think what your child needs is 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 a school where they're funded like they were funded like there was mostly white kids in that school that's the problem they don't when they when there's when there's schools that haven't got many white kids in it you can see the kind of attitude towards the local council um, towards it um, but other than that I, I, I have no idea about it. No, I mean, it's, it's just it's quite interesting that because Camden schools and Jenny yeah. may well know this yeah. um, are amongst some of the highest funded schools in the country. It doesn't mean that they're funded properly. And I, yeah. I, I organise Unison members in the schools. So I know the impact that government funding has had on it. So I know Camden schools are, do have some of the best funding and still manage to encourage uh, and still manage to have a diverse um, a very diverse student body I'm not so I don't think that was quite Jenny's um, Jenny's take on it but Gemma let me bring you in but what is the question can you ask can you tell us the question then? well I think what what she was what I think I if I'm I'm right in getting this I thought Jenny's view was how can that that be replicated elsewhere because not all areas of the country will have as diverse schooling, say as in Camden or many of the places in, in London. I think around the country you'll find other places where, you know, that will be... I, I, let me take an example. Um, I actually live in Tower Hamlets, I don't live in Camden. But my, um, my friend's daughter, who was white, went from a very diverse school in Tower Hamlets to university where there are very few black kids at the university she's gone to, you know? And some of the people that she's met at university said, oh, we never had any black kids in our school. You know, I, th I think there's, there's that element. How is, I, I think that's more what Jenny's asking rather than her son doesn't have any white friends. What colour is Jenny? I don't, I don't know what, that's what I'm saying. I don't know, you said one ethnic group. It does matter because if the ethnic group is white or if it's, they're not white, it makes a difference in the conversation. Because if they're mostly white, then or they're mostly not white. I, don't, I, don't, I mean, like, what is the, it depends on the significance. Like, if you want your school just to reflect the local community, it's what is the significance of the local community? Is it because you want it to have a diverse set of experiences or you just want it to look like your community? If you want it to look like a community, there's no value necessarily. That's just, that's just kind of like visual performativeness. But if you want it, if you feel like that would then give your child a diverse experience, then that's more what someone could like argue because there's no points. Cause it, I don't know, I just feel like I'm not yeah, really sure. Yeah, no problem. Um, I'm going to I'm I'm only going to have time really to bring Athian in on this this question if that's okay with the rest of the panel because we are running out of time unfortunately Athian how can 
What, what do you think about this? Um, I think this question, um, I think that there's, the, there's the phrase that there's a bigotry of low expectations. And I think often in terms of the way that teachers, um, some teachers perceive black students, they perceive them as being less academic, less likely to go to the top universities in this country. And I'm not one of those people who's obsessed with black excellence. I think black people are worthy of humanity regardless of what kind of educational level they achieve. But um, I think we should create kind of school environments. And I think sort of there's been some work that's done around this in other parts of London around really promoting higher education towards black students and, it, and ensuring that um, more black people go to top university. I'm answering this question like a bit of a politician. I'm kind of dodging. <laughs> but, but I think, um, yeah. yeah. Don't worry, it's okay. I mean, I, I, was, I was just going to say in a sense, that last bit brings us really almost round to almost the very first set of questions that we asked in some way. Yeah. And I think that point about um, kind of the government recently has gone on this weird tirade about what they call like critical race theory and how t people shouldn't teach anti-capitalist leagues in school. Mm. But I think this is part of a like um, an anxiety in the kind of conservative establishment establishment about the future of their political ideology. Conservative, there's kind of a time on conservatism. They they're very like they're failing to appeal to future generations, and I think we're almost emerging into a new world where different people are controlling power. And I think it'll be interesting to see the type of progress we can make it as, as kind of my generation who are overwhelmingly left-wing inherit positions of power. And um, yeah. Yeah. I, the question was kind of confusing. Yeah. No, that's, that's great. Well, look, on that point, I'm going to thank all of you for taking part in this discussion at Stella Athian, Baseo and Gemma. Really been a very good discussion this evening. I hope the people who've tuned in or whatever you, however you call it in this, <laughs> in this online thing, the people that have joined us have managed to get something out of the discussion that we've had today and really just wish everybody the best in continuing to be active because I believe that activism is a really important part of being able to change the situation that we face ourselves in is extremely important and how we draw more people into that struggle to change society is exceptionally important so thanks again to everybody and hope to see you at some of the other events that we lay on in this season and let's all hope that this season doesn't just end at being a season but does result in some structural changes taking place and it's not just black history but you know that black history isn't just a month or isn't just black history but black achievement is part of everything that we learn about so thank you all very much